Good afternoon, everyone. Quiet. It's really a pleasure to welcome you to Slack this afternoon. We have a real treat today. Our own uh, Martin Breidenbach is going to give today's colloquium. Uh, for those of you who know Marty, he doesn't really need much of an introduction, but perhaps not all of you know Marty. So he first came to Slack in 1966 as a graduate student from MIT to work on the deep inelastic experiments that you'll hear about uh, this afternoon. Uh, he got his PhD from MIT. Then he spent one year at the CERN lab in Geneva before, he, before being lured back here to Slack, and he has been at the laboratory ever since. In the intervening almost 50 years, he's worked at the, the PEP, uh, he's worked at uh, Spear, uh, he led uh, the construction and operation of the SLD detector, at the, taking data at the Z resonance. Then he moved on to study of neutrinoless double beta decay with the XO experiment. Um, and now, in retirement, he's spending his time however he wants, which includes uh, a little bit of neuroscience, some developments in compact accelerators, uh, and other topics as well. It's a real pleasure to welcome this afternoon Martin Breidenbach for a talk entitled, Early Days at Slack, The Quark Discoveries. And as he's, as he's coming up, I'll just mention that actually this, uh, the talk today is gonna be taped, uh, we'll be put on the web, just so you know. So if you have friends that couldn't be here, you can tell them they can see it uh, later online. Anyway, Martin. Thanks, Aaron. Come on. Okay, so my plan today is to talk roughly about the first decade of particle physics at Slack, as seen by a rather young physicist, namely me. Uh, if my memory is correct, that is the period before the agencies and the labs uh, invented reviews. So it was perhaps a golden age. <laughs> I also should apologize in advance to those I've omitted from this personal history. And maybe it's even good to apologize to those I have included. <laughs> so, um, this talk is dedicated to three rather important people in the history of particle physics and slack. Um, the picture shows, uh, come on, shows Dick Taylor in the control room, Bert Richter in the control room, and Henry Kendall in his natural habitat. Um, the deaths of Burton Richter and Dick Taylor brings to an end the era of the first giants at Slack, along with Sidrell and Peef. Both won Nobel Prizes for their work, and Burton went on to other accelerators, lab director of Slack, energy and energy policy. And both of them won many other awards through the years, but today's talk is about what they led at the beginning of Slack. So, um, I became a bi-coastal MIT grad student in 96. I was working for Jerry Friedman and Henry Kendall, who led the MIT contingent to Slack, and travel was uh, pretty simple. I had a travel card and just used it. And as far as I know, uh, there was no reconciliation ever. Um, this, this is what was used for transport for the younger people here. Uh, this is a Pan Am airplane. They really existed, and those are called propellers. <laughs> so, when I got here, um, this is the crew that I met. This was Dick in the control room, the counting house, on top of end station A, and he had built the spectrometers. And here's Dick again. Dick pretended to be a really, really tough guy, but he wasn't. Um, then there was Hobie, super duper physicist, and hated the limelight. And very soon after I got here, he took me off 
probably to the test lab where there was a machine called the yellow coffin. And um, that was usable when we snuck in to make beam trees. And so we did. And that was my first lesson in how to evade all the officials here and make beam trees. So that was great. And then there was PEEF. PEEF is, was simply awesome. Um, PEEF came here uh, after uh, working on instrumentation for the Manhattan Project. I believe he was on the plane uh, that followed the Enola Gay in the bombing. And then he did a stint at UC Berkeley. And he left Berkeley uh, to protest uh, their loyalty oath and came here and soon came up with the 20-page proposal for Slack, what would become Slack. And I should also point out that this proposal was typewritten double-spaced. So, OK. Uh, Peef was the director of Slack for many years and a very passionate and important voice for arms control and national security. He advised many people. Here is Peef with Eisenhower. There's Ike. Uh, here is Peef with Pompidou. Uh, Peef with Pope John Paul II. And Peef was completely willing to advise and talk to the students. We learned the code very early. If he had an office on the third floor of Central Lab with the theorists, if the office door was closed, go away. If the office door was open, which I would guess it was open a third of the time. It means, come in, let's talk. It was something else. And he picked the three Nobel Prize winners in the original Slack staff, Mr. Pearl in 95, Dick in 1990, and Burton in 76. I believe I have known all the United States HEP lab director, so Chi Chang, if you're here, that leaves you out. Um, and I would say without question, uh, Peef was the greatest and the best. So, okay, let's get into this a little bit. Um, Quarks began in 64. Uh, Murray Gilman and George Swig were the uh, ones who led the charge and developed the early work. It was a means of generating the eightfold way SU3. Uh, the spin half and fractional charges worked fine on hadrons, three valence quarks for baryons, quark and anti-quark pairs for the mesons. Uh, but uh, free quarks were never found. There was very little belief in constituent quarks. And there are some great quotes from Murray. Uh, we know that mesons and baryons are mostly, if not entirely, made up out of one another. The probability that a meson consists of a real quark pair rather than two mesons or a baryon, an anti-baryon, must be quite small. Uh, from our own BJ, um, additional data is necessary and welcome in order to destroy the picture of elementary constituents. So um, to justify the deep inelastic, uh, which was going to become my thesis, uh, it was justified on uh, studying these resonances that occur not so far from elastic scattering as a function of momentum transfer. Um, so that turned out to be totally wrong. Uh, this was also the beginning of relatively large and really effective collaborations among particle physicists, leading to the ability to build some large and complex experiments. And I'll show you some of those experiments from that era. Um, until this time, uh, university faculty could not play at long distances because they couldn't get out of teaching respons responsibilities. And MIT led the way uh, in terms of genuine teaching relief for research, not just postponement of their teaching duties. Um, also, and it was really educational for me, uh, Dick's group invited many European visitors, particularly from Germany. And those began close relationships, for example, with DAISY, uh, that are in pretty good shape today. So uh, a little bit of slack in the uh, mid to late 60s. Uh, Peef planned 
for 280, but as you can see, 280 wasn't there. This is the crossover, and he wanted it in place so that putting in the piles for the overpass wouldn't disturb the accelerator. And uh, without 280, there was negligible traffic around here. Uh, there was also the Homebrew Computer Club uh, met in the old Panofsky Auditorium. Um, here's Steve Jobs, and here's Steve Wozniak, uh, and they're playing with what became the Apple I. 67 was the summer of love in San Francisco, and um, there were Vietnam War protests uh, all over the place in those times. This is end station A. Um, the beam comes in here, and there were three spectrometers, which were key to all of this work, particularly the HF spectrometer and the 20 GF spectrometer. There was a 1.6 GeV, which we only use peripherally. And these spectrometers were able to identify scattered electrons and measure uh, their uh, momentum, their angle this way, and their angle out of the plane. Uh, measured by hotoscopes, which are arrays of scintillators. This is a picture of the real thing. And um, here is the HF. Here's the 20. It's hard to see in this picture, but it's much longer and goes off into the distance. Um, these were built mostly by SLAC Experimental Group A, Taylor's Group, a team of SLAC engineers and techs. The primary beam uh, comes in and is momentum analyzed here. Here is the target. Here's another view of the hydrogen target. This was an early one, uh, which was uh, cooled by conduction. That wasn't good enough for a high power beam. And then that was replaced with one in which the hydrogen circulated through a uh, heat exchanger and was better at keeping track of that. So again, uh, here's the top view of the 8, here's the 20, here's the 1.6, and this is the HF spectrometer again. Um, the instrumentation and the electronics for the 8 and the 20 uh, were designed and built at MIT. Uh, these are ladders of aluminum that were precision machined to hold the scintillator bars with photomultipliers. These are set of trigger counters, if you can remember such things. And this is the uh, uh, pi E separator, which we would now call a calorimeter for the HF. Uh, I built that starting as a senior at MIT and then finished that up in the early years uh, at MIT as part of thesis work. Uh, this was fun because it was long before EGS or Géant uh, was around to do Monte Carloing and make these designs uh, relatively reliable and straightforward. This is the end station A counting house. And uh, to uh, sort of acquaint you with some of the gear, uh, this was the SDS 9300. Uh, it was about a quarter of megaflop. And my old phone was about 500 megaflop just to set a scale, and it had uh, 96 kilobytes, kilobytes of memory. Um, this was the human interface device, as they're now called. It's a Model 33 teletype, and it clutters and clanks away onto real paper. Uh, this large contraption, which is half a rack wide, is one channel of an ADC. Um, these things are called scalers. They count, and they have Nixie displays of, of these counters. They were great. And this was the only video display. Uh, this particular video display was uh, in real competition because it was the only play, place that I think it was Star Wars uh, that could run on this machine with that display. Um, and finally, uh, these are the things that took the inputs uh, from the electronic channels uh, of PMTs. They were discrete transistors. And these things took up, uh, in volume, perhaps two liters a channel. And if we're doing this today, it'd be 
uh, a nanoliter per channel, and all of this junk is totally dominated by the cables and connections, which shouldn't exist anymore. Okay, so um, this was a pretty serious beam uh, that we had. So that's about a 500 kilowatt beam going into a block of copper, and that's what happens. Okay. So there it is. So um, the first physics experiments at SLAC were E4A, which was the elastic scattering of electrons on protons. Um, the very high Q-squared measurements uh, were a great lesson for the young in the statistics of low-rate experiments. We were out at a Q-squared of 25 GeV over C-squared, and if I remember correctly, the expected rate was about one event per day. And in one day, I think maybe it was the first day, we had about uh, 10 events, and a lot of us were getting quite excited that something real was going on, and Peef came by and said, stay calm, keep counting, don't worry. And uh, when we finished, uh, probably about 10 days later, the point actually came out low. So, all right. Um, E4C was a compa comparison of electron and positron scattering on protons. Um, it wasn't very exciting, nothing was expected, nothing was found. And then we get to E4B, which is a deep and elastic scattering. The first real data was taken at six degrees and 10 degrees. Um, nothing really excited was expected, but as I mentioned, that is just wrong. So first, I want to go through a typical uh, experimental problem in the end station. So I showed you this picture before, but now I'm showing you the beam, and it goes out through a protection collimator and into beam dump east. And it's a hot beam, and it caused significant background of particles spraying from this collimator getting in uh, to, through the shielding of the spectrometer. So um, we added some shielding, uh, wooden bricks stacked on a wooden table over here, and that solved the backscatter problem. Um, that's what it looked like sitting on a table. And the back spray was from an 800 kilowatt beam. Uh, it can be significant. In fact, it turns out it's enough to melt the lead bricks. And melted lead brick ignited the wood table <laughs> that it was sitting on. And so we determined that the smoke alarm works. Uh, the Slack fire department came very promptly. It then was located at Slack. And they all come in with their self-contained breathing apparatus because they don't want to breathe radioactive smoke. But without the beam, it was only smoke. The fire went off. And so we put uh, a steel sheet under the lead bricks, and um, later that evening we were running. Again, uh, no reports, no fuss. I, I even doubt that Dick Taylor knew about it. Okay, so elastic scattering. Let me just put that to bed. Uh, this is a real-time display from the SDS 9300. This is the elastic peak uh, that is to say, when an electron scatters off the proton, the proton recoils as a proton. So that's what happens. Uh, here is the same thing as offline. We did this at a large variety of Q squared. Uh, and comparing uh, that cross section to the model, uh, you can see that nothing particularly dramatic is happening. And maybe that's enough for elastic scattering. So I have to do a little language to talk about um, uh, what happens in the deep and elastic. So the primary electron beam comes in with energy E. It scatters off of a proton uh, with an energy E prime, and it scatters at an angle theta. And we do not see anything about the recoil system. So nu is the energy difference. Uh, Q squared is the momentum transfer, which is this expression, the missing mass. The mass of this state is, again, a simple expression. And what we measure, the cross-section as a function of E, E prime, and theta, is the uh, Mach cross-section, sigma m, 
describing what goes on where the electron meets a virtual photon. And then there are these two structure functions which we're interested in. And these structure functions for the proton or the neutron are everything that can be measured by scattering unpolarized electrons on an unpolarized uh, target and detecting only the electrons. Um, there are radiative corrections. Um, so in the simple uh, no radiation effect, the diagram looks like this. But you can have final state radiation where there's a photon. And you can have initial state radiation where there's a photon. And that changes the energy of the photon uh, that gets to hit the proton. So this has to be removed. This was a struggle, again, long before there were Monte Carlos. And um, I found rummaging around in my notes uh, Jerry Friedman's uh, calculations on how to take care of uh, some of this. And we're not going to do any of the details of radiative corrections today. So, uh, but just to give you an idea of how big they are, uh, here the, the, the elastic peak is cut way back, is scaled back. And this is what the resonances look like. And this is with the radiative corrections applied. You can see that it sharpens these up. And this is the ratio of before to after radiative corrections. So when you're doing anything quantitative, which we get to uh, in this region, it's quite important. So the data, um, the spectrometer magnets uh, were checked with floating wires, where you take a wire with a current going through it and run it through the magnets, and check that your, uh, everything is correct. The elastic peak is a cross-check. By modern standards, um, this was a trivial analysis. Uh, you're just counting uh, in different bins. Uh, as I said, the elastic scattering was not exciting. For the inelastic, there were some issues. Uh, for a uh, missing mass uh, that was greater than about 2 GeV, there's not a very strong Q squared dependence. So this is Q squared cross section. Here's the elastic dropping like a rock. And here it drops, but not excitingly. It's weak. And the cross section was much larger than anyone thought possible. So this is an amusing uh, part of a request for more beam time from Dick Taylor. Uh, the dependence of the deep and elastic scattering uh, uh, on Q squared is much weaker than the elastic dependence. This scattering, therefore, becomes the dominant feature of the data, even for moderate Q squared. And this is uh, from 68. So we knew that then. Scaling. OK, so BJ in 69 was telling us about uh, using current algebra. He argued that in the limit of large momentum transfer and nu, this ratio, omega 2m nu over q squared, uh, would mean that the uh, structure functions would be a function only of this variable. And um, lo and behold, that appeared to be the case that you could plot the data uh, for large enough uh, uh, missing mass as a function of omega and it lay on a universal curve. Um, this was, uh, at this point, there was scaling. It took some time to sink in. And uh, the word quark was not around very much, though we did use it in our first paper. So here's another view of that scaling. This is a cleaned up version of data that was plotted in real time in the end station counting house by BJ and Kendall. And you can get a hint of how old it is. Uh, the energy is in BEV, or Brookhaven electron volts. OK, so here's a cleaned up plot. Um, and these are different runs. Uh, of the two spectrometers, the 20 GeV and the 8 GeV. And this is the new W2, the magic function, plotted uh, at a fixed omega 4 as a function of Q squared. It's just flat. So there was scaling. So part of the problem at this time was that BJ's current algebra arguments were impenetrable for an experimentalist. Uh, 
And uh, OK, it sounded great. But then Feynman visited Slack in August of 68. And he had been thinking about what he's called partons, point light constituents. And we showed him the early data on this weak Q squared dependence and the scaling. And he went off and spent a night in a dive bar in Palo Alto, probably Antonio's, and came back the next day and explained uh, how all of this works to us. And in the infinite momentum frame, the photon just scatters off one parton. There's some final state interaction that we don't really care about. And scaling just falls right out. And this was so great. It was wonderful. It was understandable even to a uh, naive experimentalist. Here is Feynman at Slack in the old Panofsky Auditorium uh, explaining this to everyone. This was some time later. This was not the same trip. And uh, finally, uh, we got the first papers done. So these were the two papers that uh, this is rough, today is roughly the 50th anniversary of. Uh, there's the Bloom et al. Uh, paper and the uh, second paper that were, these were back to back in PRL. And this was um, October of uh, 69. So um, um, Aaron convinced me that I should tell this Murray Goldman story. So this is in 1971. I was now, well, I was then at CERN. Uh, Dick Taylor was there, and he introduced me to Murray Goldman. Dick and Murray were good friends. And so we got introduced. And one day, I get a message from uh, Professor Gelman, um, the most important theorist in the world, at least, yes. And he said, uh, could I come over to his office? He had something to ask me. OK, I went over to his office. He says, sit down. And he goes to one of the boards. And he starts writing down, uh, uh, filling one board with pure theoretical gore. I hadn't a clue. It probably was current algebra something. I had not a clue. And he, said, he finishes the one board. And he says, OK, does the data say this? Or he goes to the second board <laughs> and fills that one and says, does the data say, or does it say this? And I start mumbling that the errors were too big to tell, and blah, blah, blah. And, and, and I made a quick escape. <laughs> so maybe a month later, I run into Murray in the CERN parking lot outside the canteen. And uh, we chat for a minute, and he says, I'm having trouble with my car. It's overheating. Could you possibly help me? I said, OK, I can take a look. And he goes and he lifts up the hood. And staring you in the face was there was no radiator cap on the radiator. <laughs> and I looked around. And there in a fender well was the radiator cap. And I take it and I put it on. And he says, wow, that's going to fix it? I said, well, yeah. I mean, you know, if you don't pressurize the radiator, it's going to overheat and boil. And you know, you know sophomore thermodynamics. <laughs> OK. So uh, in 1990, uh, we got the word that the deep and elastic won uh, the Nobel Prize. Uh, you probably recognize most of these characters. Uh, and that was that night at Dick's house. And uh, then um, um, I like this quote. Eventually, the notion that. Theoretical speculations are focused on the possibility that these data might give evidence on the behavior of point-like structures in the nucleon. But that got accepted. There was a Nobel Prize. That line was Panofsky in Vienna in 68. Uh, Here are the winners. Uh, they took uh, the gang uh, to Stockholm. And this is a picture at the hotel in Stockholm before the big ceremony where you all had to get dressed up as penguins. OK, so in the early 70s, uh, what do we have? The nucleons have point-like constituents consistent with quark charge assignments and spin a half. Uh, 
QCD uh, from Gross and Wilczek and Pollitzer was explain, explain the absence of free quarks. Uh, asymptotic freedom explains scaling, but needs deviations from scaling, which indeed show up. Um, the bunch of models, bootstraps from Berkeley, nuclear democracy, vector mess on dominance, diffraction models, they're all faded away. Uh, inventing color for QCD fixed the Pauli principle problems. And the gluons in QCD carry half the nucleon momentum. The rest is taken care of by quarks. So that ends segment one. OK. So now I want to move to um, E plus E minus annihilation and Spear and Charm from the November Revolution. So this is an aerial view of Spear for the few of you who uh, use it. Uh, it's not entirely covered by uh, photon beam lines. Uh, this is where the magnets were. And uh, this was led by Burton Richter. Here, here's a view inside Spear. It was led by Richter after a long, long struggle to get $6 million. And it eventually uh, was done uh, somewhat informally with the agency, but it was only $6 million. Um, this is the first detector. Its formal name was the Slack LBL magnetic detector. Uh, later, it became Mark I, once Mark II was there. Here is Vera working on this thing. Uh, here is the end view. So I mean, with a person there, you get an idea of the scale of this thing. Now, this was, I think the, well, I don't think. It was the first of the four pi, almost four pi, cylindrical electronic detectors with tracking in an axial field. And this was conceived by Burton. And that was a big, big deal. It's critically different from the spectrometers at, for example, uh, the CERN ISR, where I was before I came here, and where we were producing a size like MAD, but couldn't see them at all. This was ready for data in February 73. This is the control room scene. Uh, this is the center. We had our own screens for things like this now. Uh, this is called a reel-to-reel -reel tape drive. And you mount the tape with your hands. And it holds a stunning 140 megabytes of reel. OK. And uh, here's a modern version of a teletype. But it still was uh, pretty much uh, a really important uh, human interface device. So. In 73, 74, uh, we were working on a paper which was late, um, which was on this ratio called R, the ratio of hadrons to mu pairs uh, versus the energy of the machine. Uh, this ratio can be interpreted easily, directly, as the sum of the squares of the quark charges. And it was strangely large in results we'd heard about from Adone and the CEA, which was a hint for the colored quarks. Uh, this was an R meter, which in real time would tell us the value of R. Um, and there was maybe a little bit of discussion of resonances, but it was not serious. It was accepted. All the theorists knew that if there were resonances at all, it was unlikely. But if there were, it would be several hundred MeV wide and with an R increase of a few. So in 73, we measured R. Uh, to bracket this region in 200 MeV steps. And two of the runs seemed high. And in June of 74, we remeasured the 3.1, 3.2 bracketing, and 3.3 bracketing uh, that energy, and 4.1, 4.2, and 4.3, just before the sh summer shutdown. And I did a quick uh, analysis on the uh, 4.2 bump and left a logbook note which said, literally, uh, the whiz-bang analysis team says there is no bump at 4.2, which is almost true. So 74, uh, several of us, uh, led by Roy Schwitters, were playing with the data around 3.1 GeV. And what we found were that runs at nominally exactly the same energy were statistically inconsistent with each other. And at first, uh, we didn't get excited. Uh, we suspected software. 
and we went to the first interactive video display at Slack, which was connected to the mainframe, this huge monstrosity in a private room that you had to reserve. Uh, and we classified the event pictures and made tallies by hand. And we couldn't find anything wrong. So uh, that summer, uh, Spear was upgraded to Spear 2, a high energy machine, and uh, they wanted to run above uh, 5GEV. And Roy and Ewan and I argued and argued with Richter to go back to 3.1 GV. And Burton, always wanting to go forward, argued that it was more interesting to go ahead into new higher energy. And there was a Friday uh, where Gerson Goldhaber from uh, UC Berkeley reported, um, it was a mistake as it turned out, uh, that the high cross section runs at 3.1 had an excess of K-shorts. So Burton, in a somewhat annoyed way, gave us the weekend to waste. His words. So um, Friday was a mess. Um, we had vacuum problems. Saturday evening, uh, something was clearly very strange going on. We were doing most of this analysis at this point uh, by this uh, very advanced analysis technique. And, um, you know, it seemed really big. And what we were soon realizing is that um, the DAC, which set the spear bend energy, was stepping right across some very fine structure. And Harvey, I think this is your writing, um, uh, we all found that the energy of the machine could be tweaked, vernered, by changing the RF frequency. So instead of this great big DAC step, uh, you could sit at one point on the bend magnets and change the RF frequency of the machine. And since the electrons and positrons going around had to stay in sync, they would have to move out in radius or in, a radius, or in with radius as you change the frequency to stay in sync. And this changed their energy. And this worked. So on Sunday, um, there were beginning to be plots of what was going on. Uh, we were beginning to break out uh, champagne, or maybe, yes. Uh, here's Vera, me, uh, Gerson. And there were uh, peaks on log plots. And that's what we needed at first uh, to see this. On Monday, Next day, um, we um, uh, put together what was going to become this paper, Discovery of a Narrow Resonance in E plus E minus. Um, I want you to notice the huge number of authors on this paper, uh, which is about th three times as big as the deep and elastic, but OK. Uh, and so there were three PRLs that were published on December 2nd, one from Slack, one from Brookhaven, which was Sam Ting's J, and Adone, the machine in Italy, which had essentially pushed uh, its ring magnets as high as they could uh, to reach this thing. And this is a cleaned up plot of the cross section for hadrons, and all looking pretty. The visible width of this thing was dominated by spear energy spread, and we could get the true width uh, from the bright Wigner shape and it was 91 keV, very narrow, not a couple of hundred of MeV, which was ex expected. So um, there was this particle, same thing actually, called the J uh, and at BNL. And it was often asked, uh, unfortunately, particularly at MIT, uh, didn't we know about wh what was found at BNL? And the answer is simply, no. Um, Roy, Vera, you and I were not smart enough to convince Burton when he didn't want to if we had, you know. Anyway, uh, Sam was there at Slack that Monday uh, for a meeting of the PAC, the Policy Advisory Committee. And Roy and Vera and I were in this tiny little conference room on the second floor editing the latest draft when Peef through someone summoned Roy to his office and Roy returned an hour later, half an hour later, totally white, and announced that 
Sam has the same thing. And that afternoon, again, in the old uh, Panofsky Auditorium, a joint seminar was held, led by Roy and by Sam, on what this was. So, um, um, the next week. So the obvious question was, were there more narrow resonances? We still didn't really understand what this all was. So Bob Mellon, who is a great engineer working on, uh, uh, on Spear, he changed the DAC and the Spear controls so that the energy could be controlled in fine steps. And Lenny Schustek, a name some of you might know from the, he's the uh, father and operator of the Computer History Museum. Uh, uh, he and I invented a way to use the IBM Model 91 as a useful uh, real-time computer, basically hacking our way in. And, okay. And then uh, Terry Goldman and I concocted a very crude positronium model of the psi, and we predicted 3.7 JEV for the 2S state. And so a little below that is where we started the scan. And on Thursday, um, uh, Spear was stepped in increments of one MeV for a three minute run, analyzed in real time by the 91 and plotted. And late that evening, uh, I got a call from Chuck, who's here someplace. Uh, this is a log book from Chuck, Son of Glory. And there was another one. And uh, there was some slight consideration of trying this again uh, that night, uh, but we decided instead, instead to re to rescan the Psi prime, which is probably wise. It certainly was conservative. And so um, here we are. It looks good. Um, I called Peef at about 5 o'clock, and Adele says he's taking a bath. Should she get him? And I go, ah, uh, uh, um, yes. <laughs> and um, he was excited and came right in. Um, we wanted to have something of a formal announcement, but since we were using the 91, uh, I called the head of our computer department, whatever it was called then, it certainly wasn't called IT, and asked him to leave, it th normally came down uh, in the morning for maintenance, and I asked him to leave it up because we were using it. So this comes out on every teletype all over the site and anywhere else in the world somebody was connected. Uh, do to the new particle discovery, the system was not taken down this morning. <laughs> so that, that, that was the announcement. And, and then, of course, uh, in very rapid uh, time, uh, there was a second paper. OK, so um, um, this was uh, the checkout scan, this was uh, what it looked like over a wider range, and uh, this was a higher resolution scan, and we got the width of that thing, and it's another uh, very narrow resonance, very pretty, very narrow resonance. So charm, uh, here we are. Uh, this was finally figured out uh, that uh, this was a state, that the psi was a state of CC bar, and there was an incredible orgy of charmonium spectroscopy and charm mesons being discovered. Uh, this is the psi prime and its so-called self-identification decay, uh, where it goes to a psi plus two pi's. Uh, this is the work of the crystal ball with Elliot leading it. I think I saw Elliot. Um, uh, and the E plus E minus can only go to states with the same JPC, but other states are accessible through radiative decays. And this is the famous plot of the radio tran transitions uh, from, the, from the psi. So uh, charm neutral mesons were discovered in 76. So these are states of CU bar or C bar U. Uh, this was the work uh, of uh, Gerson Goldhaber and Francois Pierre. Uh, these were the D0 decays that were measured, and here are the bumps uh, that you see uh, from these charmed neutral mesons. Then there were charmed charge mesons a little later. Uh, 
these are states of CD bar and C bar D, a mass of 1876. The people really behind this analysis were Ida Peruzzi and Marcello Piccolo, our Italian collaborators who were there. And again, uh, these are nice bumps that stand out. Jets. So if the decay is into jets, they should uh, go and have some angle associated with one jet to the other before they decay. Um, the, uh, they create a train of more pairs uh, that combine to form real hadrons. And conservation of momentum from the back-to-back -back pairs should lead to opposing jets. But they're still hard to see. In 75, Gail Hansen and Roy Schwitters uh, found strong evidence for jet structure at Spear 2 and that the angular distribution of the jet axis required a spin half partons. So this is what you would expect if nothing was going on, and this is the jet model. And uh, there's Gail. So after all of this, uh, yes, there is a fourth quark. Um, this was a cartoon from uh, David Jackson at Berkeley, wrote the famous book on uh, uh, electrodynamics. And this is a cartoon from Roy and Bob Gould, uh, one experiment outweighing all these thousands of theory papers. So uh, very soon after, uh, Richter and Tang got the 1976 Nobel Prize uh, for their pioneering work in the discovery of a heavy elementary particle of a new kind. This was only two years. Contrast it with the delay for the deep and elastic, which was from roughly uh, 1970 to 1990. Okay, uh, it was an exciting time. Martin Pearl had been hunting for heavy leptons, I think, all of his life, maybe even as a little kid. And so the notion of pair-produced heavy leptons in E-plus collisions was a natural search uh, for Martin and Gary Feldman when Spear got going. And they searched for so-called anomalous uh, opposite charged E mu events uh, that came from a pair of heavy leptons that decayed. So you'd make a pair of heavy leptons, and when they decay, the charge on one side was opposite that on the other side. Um, there had been searches at Spear 1, and it showed nothing. Uh, in late 70, that can't be right, not in late 70, um, I must have the date wrong. Emu events with missing energy but no other particles began to show up. And Pearl and Feldman conducted a very slow, very careful analysis to convince an obviously skeptical collaboration that they had a real signal uh, with satisfactory left, uh, left hand identification and they understood what was happening. And in August 75, they wrote a PRL. Oh, I'm sorry, 74 is right. Uh, evidence for anomalous lepton in E plus E minus annihilation. And the challenge was the electron on muon ID. There were large backgrounds. Uh, it motivated several uh, rather ad hoc additions to the detector. Um, uh, Gary uh, piled the set of muon absorbers on top of Mark I, and with better identification, you could actually see some clean EMU events. So um, the uh, muon uh, has a low energy in the shower counter. Uh, that's this number, and it goes out. And you can see it going out through uh, this tower, the muon tower. And the other side is the electron. It has a high energy in the calorimeter consistent with a showering electron. So this improved the muon identification. Uh, there was some confusion because of the charm D meson. There was confirmation from DAISY in 77 uh, as um, evidence for heavy leptons. And the other detector uh, at uh, DAISY, at DARIS, called DASP, originally said, nah, there's no heavy leptons. So uh, by 78, uh, the semi-leptonic decay of the taus were measured. Uh, tau goes to pi minus nu tau at 11.7% uh, by four separate experiments. Tau mass was measured by Delco at Spear uh, 
uh, in 78. And it's how lifetime measurements required higher energies at Pep and Doris. And John Jaros, uh, using a precision vertex detector, uh, led the way to a tau lifetime of 10 to the minus 13 seconds. And uh, in 95, uh, Pearl wins the Nobel Prize with Frederick Rhinus. This is R, now making complete sense. This is, again, the ratio uh, to muons uh, which is the sum of the squares of the charges. And radiative tail is taken out. So there are four colored quarks. There's a tau plus corrections, Hamarari. Uh, first explain this in a model with the old quark triplet and a new heavy anti-quark triplet. But all of this was now making complete sense. So I want to move to parity violation for a moment. Um, the glashow salam weinberg unification of the weak and electromagnetic forces required parity violation in electron interactions. And there were uh, optical rotation measurements in bismuth vapor uh, experiments, I believe at Berkeley, uh, that could find no effect. And if they were right, uh, if there was uh, uh, upper limits, if it was not seen, that would be the end of the weinberg salam version of the standard model, an essential part. And at Slack, uh, Charlie Prescott realized that a high energy polarized electron beam uh, scattering on deuterium should have a left-right asymmetry, and that you could use gallium arsenide photocathodes as a high current source. So building the source, Charlie, Ed Garwin, Roger Miller, and others took about four years. This is the apparatus in, in station A. And um, they saw parity violation as clear as could be. And with a statistical significance greater than 10 sigma, uh, they got a measurement of the Weinberg angle. These confirmed uh, Weinberg's model and agreed with grand unification. All was well. OK, so in the late 60s to the early 70s, the SLAC MIT deep and elastic experiments provided the experiment, first experimental evidence for partons and then their identification as quarks. The discovery of charm in 74 convinced any last doubters of charm. The discovery of tau and parity violation further put together the standard model. And in those days of quarks and the beginnings of the standard model, uh, this lab was really the place to be. Thank you. for that beautiful talk. We definitely have some time for questions. OK, so I'm going to, oh, Jonathan has one. Mike. It certainly was all about resonances. Whether the words deep and elastic were actually there, I doubt it. In the 50s uh, in Chicago, at a, that's the first time I saw Peef. Uh, and I guess it was after Hofstadter had done uh, the elastic scattering for the size of the proton. There was a talk by Peef uh, in Chicago about a new thing, deep inelastic scattering, uh, where it was photoproduction, but with a different Q squared is the way I understood it in those So that, days. that of course, goes all the way back to the justification for building Slack in the first place. Yes. But and I think that the proposal that Marty mentioned, the I think, I think you're right, but I'm not sure. I can and likewise, I the Spear experiment never mentioned uh, finding uh, new quarks. It did mention looking for heavy leptons. I think it's characteristic of these experiments that it was the accelerators that provided this wonderful basis and that uh, for these surprises, which I think is an interesting part of the history, too. Well, I mean, 
there is nothing in terms of shock and surprise to compare with the psi because that was instantly statistically overwhelming, uh, no real analysis required. And to anybody who looks at the uh, LHC experiments where they struggle and struggle and struggle with statistics, this is so different. I mean, measuring those, those, the, those peaks in sigma was silly. It, I think the significance was never mentioned in those papers. Right there. Chuck. So Marty, uh, you uh, made a prediction of where the psi prime uh, mass would be, where it would show up. You missed um, by about two hours um, uh, of scan time because this, the control room was loaded with people as we started that scan and everybody got tired after about an hour and went home and by four o'clock we had the damn thing. So you were not off by very much. So we deliberately started low. So, <laughs> that, no, 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 starting low was completely deliberate. So, uh, uh, so that if we were wrong, uh, you'd still find it. You really wanted to be there and you weren't. It's too bad that you weren't. I, I, was, I was dead tired, yeah. you called me up, and I said, sort of said, that's very nice, and wanted to go back to sleep, and, that, <laughs> and then I couldn't, and then I calculated where the side double prime would be, and I said, nah, and then I came in. So. Whoops. Another point that you just made. Um, those two peaks were clearly, clearly identifiable in there um, in real time while we were sitting there taking data. And I've been thinking about this over the years, and there is essentially no other experiment in particle physics I, that I can think of that where the data was actually um, seen, observed, and we were convinced in real time while the experiment was running, the beams were going, we were looking at the thing happen. So I remind you of one little detail. Uh, Mark I had uh, a tracking detector, which was a spark chamber. And so there was a significant electrical discharge which got into the PA system and made a click. And you could tell by ear when you were on the resonance. <laughs> Helen. Oh, Helen. Oh, use the mic, Alan. Uh, it's here. Okay. In 1972, BJ and I sent a memo to Bert and Jerry O'Neill telling them to search for narrow resonances, in a, do a scan to search for narrow resonances at Spear. And because we told them the resonances were really narrow, they came back and said, that's ridiculous. It would take too long. We couldn't possibly do that. And I think I still have a copy of that memo. We actually, we actually picked the wrong example. We, in our discussions, we said, because there were, there were papers basically from, from Glashowiliopoulos and Mayani, who said either it's charm or there's an additional lepton, and this is another way you can avoid the, the strangest changing neutral currents. And we picked that example to illustrate why there would be narrow resonances. So but at least- in both cases, <laughs> They would have been. At least when we were doing it, there was very much the feeling that, as I said, resonances were unlikely, and if there were, they'd be 100 MeV. It, it all depended on which theorist you talked to. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. I agree. Michael. Well, Jonathan made the point that it's all due to the accelerators, but I'd like to push back a little that this experiment, um, both the, the beams that were used and the nature of the detector played an important role. You emphasized that this Mark I detector was the first four pi detector where you could really visualize the whole structure of the event. Um, simultaneous with this, CERN was doing a colliding beam experiment with protons at a facility called the ISR the ISR experiments were typically so-called double-arm spectrometers. I think I mentioned this. He was asleep. Where you would look at, at two very narrow cones and correlate particles. <coughs> Oddly, the only double-arm experiment that really made an impact was Sam Ting's experiment where he looked for muons. Um, the, the other aspect, though, is the use of the E plus E minus initial state. Right after the discovery of the psi, um, certainly on the East Coast where I was, 
all the big theorists said, oh, it's got to be charm. And people had to look for the charm particles. And then paper after paper came out of Fermilab where they looked for k pi distributions for a bump, and they didn't see anything. But this was before the invention of the trigger in hadron physics. So the charm was here, and the total cross-section was five orders of magnitude higher, and there was no chance. It was only at the plus e minus facility that you could actually see the peak in its full size and discover the charm mesons. So both aspects actually played in. We have time for one more question. So, oh, Lance. So you mentioned, I guess, about, what, 12 people signing the first Deep and Elastic paper? I'm just curious how many technicians and engineers contributed to building the spectrometers that you showed? Because they're pretty massive, and I think you must have had a fair amount of help from the, yeah. We did, we did. Um, actually, as I mentioned at the very beginning, we didn't have to deal with reviews. Um, there were, if I remember correctly, uh, two engineers, I may be wrong, uh, Bill Davies White was one, and I'm going to block on another name. Uh, it was small, it was really small, and it was fast. Um, I probably shouldn't go out on this limb, but I will. It was the era of strong spokespeople, and you got things done. You didn't waste your time crapping around. And you could build, PEEF built Slack from start to finish in five years. And now, how many years does it take for an upgrade to the LHC? Okay, on that note, let's on that. thank Marty again. <laughs>